It's the second week of July, and if you look closely, you'll see less than a bubble a minute passing through our airlock. That means fermentation is complete, and we can get on with clearing and bottling our wine. Hello and welcome to English Country Life. Welcome to the kitchen. Welcome to the third in our series on making elderflower wine. In the first video, we looked at how to pick a blossom, how to gather them together in a basket, how to make a flavoured must ready for fermenting. In the second, we looked at the fermentation process, the vessels you need to ferment in, like a demijohn or a bung and an airlock, the addition of sugar, the addition of yeast, getting it all to start. That fermentation process is now finished. So now what we need to look at is how to get our wine crystal clear and ready for bottling. Having established that fermentation is complete, take a good look at your demijohns. What you should find, now that the gas bubbles are not rising frequently, is that the yeast has finished its process and settled to a clear layer at the bottom. If you look carefully here, you can see above the glass a clear layer of white inactive yeast. The easiest way to get the wine off the sediment is to siphon the wine from the sediment. A siphon, and its most basic, is a piece of plastic or rubber tubing. I'm going to use one that's a little bit more sophisticated and we'll take a look at it closely and I'll explain why it's helpful. This is the siphon that I use. They're not expensive, you can buy them for a couple of quid from Wilco's, but you can use any little bit of plastic tubing. This just makes the job a bit easier. Let me explain to you why. At one end, it's got a stiff plastic pipe and a weird cup thing. The stiff pipe makes it easy to get the tube to the bottom of the demijohn you're siphoning out of. This weird cup arrangement has a solid base and it sucks from sort of halfway up inside. So what happens is when that touches down on the sediment, you'll get a little cloud of sediment, but it doesn't get sucked up the pipe because it hits that sidewall and liquid from higher up goes down into that cup and gets drawn up the siphon. So in effect, that little cup arrangement prevents you sucking up the sediment. At the other end, there's a tap. And if you don't know how a siphon works, you put one vessel up high, one vessel down low, and you suck liquid into the tube. And gravity then takes that liquid and pushes it down to the lower vessel. So it continuously sucks down from the high vessel to the low. Using this kind of siphon, what you can do is suck up liquid into the tube and then close the tap. And you can put the tap into the lower vessel, open the tap, and gravity will take care of the rest. What I've done then is remove the airlock and very carefully lowered the end of the siphon into the fermented wine. I've now sucked wine into the siphon, I open the tap, and you can see it come pouring into the lower vessel. If you look very carefully, I hope you can also see that the white sediment layer is undisturbed. At the end of the siphoning process then, we've got a demijohn with a couple of centimetres, three quarters of an inch of wine and dead yeast. And we've got another demijohn that doesn't have all that sediment, but isn't entirely full. Don't please risk trying to dredge out every last cc of the wine. It's cost you almost nothing to make. Don't risk clouding it up by bringing over the sediment. What you can do, if it bothers you hugely, is make an extra half demijohn when you do these runs and just top up the wine that you've siphoned across. That process, the siphoning off from the sediment into a clean sterile demijohn. It's called racking off. So you ever hear people talking about racking off their wine? That's what they've done. And that's all you need to know. 
If you want to get your wine crystal clear, you can see it's still cloudy. Leave it in its brown paper wrapper for another couple of weeks, rack it off again, two weeks more, rack it off again, until you're happy with the level of clarity you achieve. There are, though, techniques to accelerate that process. This is one of them. This is called Finings. Inside this box are two little bottles labelled, helpfully, Wine Finings A and Wine Finings B. And what Finings do is that they will attract all the particles together to form clumps and accelerate the settling out to the bottom. And what you do in each demijohn, you put half a teaspoon of A, swirl it all into the mixture, leave it for half an hour, put in half a teaspoon of B, give it another swirl, and leave the whole shebang then for about three days. And that should really accelerate the next level of settling out. So why don't we give that a try? And then you can decide whether you want to do it with your wine. Let's have a look how it's done. This then is the finings process. Take out your airlock. Usually, if you're me, you manage to sit that on its side and spill all the water out. Pour out half a teaspoon, two and a half mil of finings liquid and drop it in. On this occasion, I'm using Findings Liquid A. In half an hour, I'll use Findings Liquid B. And then simply swirl your demijohn to ensure you get an even mix. We've given the findings a few days to work. Let's have a grand reveal. That's the sort of level of clarity we should be looking for. You should be able to see through it. It shouldn't be like musty and swamp water. It's got to look like wine. So you can see at the bottom a clear layer of white sediment and that's where all the yeast has settled down to the very bottom of the wine and above it is a good clear wine. So the next step we're going to do is to siphon off that wine away from the sediment so that we don't stir up the sediment in later processes. First step then that we need to do is to rack our cleared wine off the sediment again. In exactly the same way as before, we'll use a siphon. There we have it. You can see the tiles through that wine, it's that clear. And to be honest, you can bottle that now. If you're happy with that level of clarity, crack on. I think what you might notice is that the demijohn in the centre is slightly clearer than the damage on the right. Not sure quite why, but for one reason or another, the centre one's cleared slightly better, and that shows there is still a small amount of suspended particulates in the wine. So we're going to put that through a wine filter. They're relatively cheap. You can buy them from homebrew shops, places like Wilco's. We'll show you how they work. And I'll also draw your attention to the fact that we have just a little bit of wine in a third demijohn. And that's one of my little tips and tricks, is generally every time you rack the wine, every time you filter the wine, you lose a little bit. And I don't want to make up the volume of water, so I generally make a little bit of extra wine in a third demijohn just to top up anything that we've lost. This is a Vinbright wine filter. And you use it by siphoning the wine through it. And in this section, held between the purple and white plastic, is a screw-on support. Just unscrews. Like that. And into that gap, you put a disposable filter. And it's called a filter pad. It's the nearest I could describe it is very thick blotting paper. And you pop that in here, support it with the screws, etc. And then you run a demijohn full of water through it. And that swells the fibres in this very thick pad and makes a very fine filter. And you run your wine through it and that very fine filter captures the very last little bits of suspended matter in your wine. So first up, we run a load of clean water 
through the filter pad to swell its fibres and make it as tight a filter as we can. You can see how it works now. It works like any other siphon, but sitting above the lower demi John is a very fine filter catching any particles before the wine, or the water in the, at the moment, passes through into it. It's a very simple process, but it works well. We've had this filter for probably approaching 20 years. There really isn't much to go wrong with them. Having run a demijohn of clean water through the filter to swell the fibres, we just run the wine through the filter. And that'll get rid of any final particles in the wine, leaving us with a crystal clear finished product. We've produced there an absolutely beautiful, crystal bright wine with a fantastic, all English traditional flavour that no commercial operator can begin to rival. Next job is to bottle it. There's about four options for bottling wine, so let me bring you in close and we'll have a chat about different ways, high tech, low tech, that we can get our wine into bottles. Save up your wine bottles, get your friends to save them for you too, but be clear on what type you want. There are two types of wine bottles. There's the traditional cork type, like this, and there's a screw top type. If you want to go the screw top route, there's two kinds of replacement caps available, and I don't suggest reusing the caps they came with, because they get bent when you remove them, and they don't give a good seal if you use them again and again. They're intended as a one-time item. So if you're going to use screw caps, go on to someone like Amazon, get either replacement one-time metal screw caps, or plastic reusable screw caps. Cost a little more, but you can use them again and again. If you're going for corks, you've got three options. You can use these things, which just push in. I don't like them. They don't give a good seal a lot of the time, so I don't suggest you do that. Two options remain then. This is a traditional parallel sided cork. But again, if you go to a homebrew shop or Amazon or eBay, you can get tapered corks. When the tapered corks come in a little bit and you can just simply push them into the neck of the bottle with a dowel and a mallet. Very simple and they work really well. If you're doing a lot of corking, I suggest investing in one of these. This is a corking gun. And what you do is you load a parallel sided cork into the chamber, put the neck of the wine bottle here, pull down the handles and it drives a parallel sided cork into the neck of the bottle. That's what we use. They're great, I really like them. They're not for the first time you make wine, but if you've made a lot of wine and you're deciding that you're going to carry on doing it, it's a good thing to ask for for your next birthday present. When you've made your decision what kind of bottles and what type of seals you want to use on them, Wash and sterilise your bottles the same way that you washed and sterilised your demijohn. For filling the bottles, you don't need to be fancy. I find a funnel works well, but lift the funnel slightly. If you don't, you tend to get air locks and it sort of splurts and bubbles as you pour the wine in. If you lift the funnel just a little bit, what you'll find is the air that's been pushed out of the bottle as the wine goes in can escape around the sides of the neck of the funnel. We wind the bottle, pop your corking gun on top and drop a cork into the chamber and centre it. Lower the handles so the ram is touching the cork and the grips are holding the neck of the bottle and then push down firmly. And that drives the cork into the bottle quite easily. Sometimes it doesn't quite go all the way and you need to tap it in with a dowel and mallet. Often depends on the quality of the corks that you're using. These are an interesting little addition to your wine if you want a professional finish. They're called shrink caps. You pop one on the neck of the bottle like that, plunge the whole thing into boiling water and it shrinks down and grips the neck of the bottle and fully seals the mouth of your wine. So get a pan, deepish one, of properly boiling water and just for about one or two seconds pop your shrink cap in and you get a fully sealed bottle. 
Once you put your shrink caps on, if you're choosing to use them, put a label on your wine. Say what the wine is and what year you made it, because all wines, and especially country wines, benefit from six months to a year in the bottle, and they're only going to get better for the first five years. There we have a dozen bottles of first-rate elderflower wine ready for drinking by next summer. I firmly believe that English country wines done well, proper technique, proper clarity, good quality ingredients with a bit of patience, are the rival of any wine in the world, grape based or otherwise. If you don't think so, try a really well made blackberry wine. Thick, luscious, fruity, dark. It's just wonderful. Try a great quality elderflower, beautifully chilled on a warm summer's day. These flavours are the rival of anything in the wine world. If you've enjoyed this kind of content, could you do us a favour? Give us a thumbs up down below, just take five seconds. Even better, leave us a comment. I'd love to hear about your experiences of country wines. And if you want to hear more of what we do, click the subscribe down below and the bell next to it, and you'll hear every time we upload a video. But whatever you do, come back and see us soon. Take care.